Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is a new vision of the unexplained. And with me is Whitley Strieber, author of more than 40 books, including many well-known horror and science fiction novels, such as Wolfen. There are also a number of best-selling non-fiction books, including Communion, A True Story, Breakthrough, The Next Step, Solving the Communion Enigma, What is to Come, The Key, A True Encounter, The Secret School, Preparation for Contact, Transformation, The Breakthrough. He is also co-author with Ann Streber of the Communion Letters, The Truth is Out There for Those Who Dare to Read It, and The Afterlife Revolution, and he is co-author with Professor Jeffrey Kripal of The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained, which will be the focus of today's interview. That book is really a summary and analysis of his previous nonfiction books. And also, he wrote the foreword for Jacques Vallée's book, Dimensions, A Casebook of Alien Contact. Once again, this conversation will take place via the Internet. So now I'll switch over to the Internet video. Welcome, Whitley. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've been looking forward to uh, being able to uh, be with you uh, together for a long time. Me too, Jeffrey. And uh, we've had plenty of trouble getting this scheduled, so I'm very glad to be here. Well, we're going to be talking about your uh, the book, uh, The Supernatural, that you co-authored with Jeffrey Kripal, and uh, he will be uh, with me tomorrow, and we'll do a part two. So we'll have yeah. uh, both of you uh, for this. But it strikes me as I look at uh, your portion of that book that it's basically a summary of uh, your nonfiction work um over the last, I, gosh, it's uh, well over 30 years now. Yes, it's a, exactly that. It's a summation of, really, of, of a very extraordinary life experience and one that I either was, was, I was intended for or that I happened into. I'm not really sure which. But it, was, uh, it has been a remarkable life, and it still is. It's, if anything, more is going on right now than has ever gone on in my life before. So it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, one of the themes that really struck me as I look back on your work is that you have been endeavoring, I would say, quite consistently to attract the uh, attention of uh, the scholarly community, the scientific community, and, and the world at large. And, and your fundamental claim is that this, this is a, a phenomenon that you don't want to necessarily label. There are many possible labels, but Whatever it is, it's it's real and it deserves serious attention. Well, yeah, I have been trying to do that and have actually had some success with it, or there wouldn't be a Jeffrey Kripal coming next in the next show, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, because he's a very distinguished scholar. And, and uh, I've also had uh, some success in the scientific community as well, but there I'm rather limited in that I, the only materials that I have possession of and science needs something to work on are actually implanted in my ear. And I don't want them taken out because it's I've learned how to use this thing and I don't want to I wouldn't br break it for the world. Let's start there, then. It's a good entryway. Uh, I know you describe in, in the book uh, having a very distinct uh, memory of, uh, I think it was two individuals. Uh, yes. They looked human, as I recall. And they did. And, and they basically inserted this object, uh, which remains in, I, I gather, in the earlobe. It's right here in this earlobe. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, yeah, it happened in May 
of 1989. In one of my books, it says May of 1994, but that's a typographical error from the publisher, not from me. It was in May of 1989 that it happened. I was awake and uh, I had just turned out the light and was just literally getting ready to go to sleep. And the, I suddenly uh, heard a voice or maybe, maybe I wasn't, maybe I had dozed off and I, yes, I get the sequence. I think I had just dozed off and I, then I heard gravel crunching in the driveway uh, under the bedroom windows. We had a gravel driveway there and that crunching gravel immediately alerted me because it was the sound of tires on the gravel and there were no lights out there. We had a big heavy gate and you didn't get in there in the night. And plus you, you, no one who shows up at your house in the middle of the night with their lights off, getting past a heavy locked gate is going to be good news. That was very clear at once. As I came, became aware of this, I sat up in bed and I heard a voice in the backyard say very clearly, condition red. At that moment, I saw standing across the room at the, in the doorway in the center that the hall, the, the bedroom had a doorway at the end of the bedroom that led into a corridor and they were standing there. A man and a woman, the man was, the woman was in front, the man behind, and they immediately rushed forward. At the same time, at first, when I heard the voice, I was trying to, heard the gravel. I was trying to open, turn on a bank of lights that would turn on floodlights all around the house. Then when I heard the voice and saw the people, I started to go for the shotgun under my bed instead. The, I was aware of the fact that the LEDs on the alarm system were still red. In other words, it was not, it had not been turned off, but they got to the bedside. And what I then remember is I was on my right side facing toward my wife, who was on the other side of the bed, and someone was pressing down on my left side of my head on my ear, this here. It felt like with their hand or with something. And the woman's voice was speaking very soothingly to me. Then it ended. There was a flash of light and a great deal of crashing in the woods, someone running through the woods. I leaped out of bed, grabbed the pistol, which was in the, it's not like I was not armed or prepared in the, uh, in the bedside table. Uh, I was, I lived in a virtual armory in those days and began running through the house because I had the LEDs were still on the alarm system was on. And these people had been there. There was no question whatsoever in my mind about it. I went through the attics, basement, everywhere. There was not a single breach at all. So I went back to sitting on the bedside thinking, was this some kind of incredibly bizarre dream? What am I actually capable of here? And I finally, I lay down and went into an uneasy, what I would describe as a half sleep for the rest of the night. In the morning, I told Anne about it and she said, well, you know, the alarm system is still on as it still was. And I said, well, I'm going to go out and get the paper. But in order to get the paper, you had to go down to the, you had to take the car down to the corner about two miles away and uh, go to a little newsstand that was there. So, I opened the door to the garage, and to my astonishment, the system had a breach. The garage door was wide open, and that can't be, not with the alarm system still running. So I turned off the alarm system and got in the car, started to back out, still not fully understanding what was going on, electrical flashes started hitting my hands and face inside the car scared the hell out of me i thought the whole thing was about to blow up i jumped out of the car and ran back in the house and said and there's something wrong here the garage door was wide open and the alarm system wasn't tripped 
she said, well, we need to call the alarm man who lived right down the road. He was only a few, only a short distance away. So I telephoned him and I said, something's weird going on here. Our alarm system is, was not tripped and the garage door was wide open. He said, well, I'll come look at it right away. And he drove over and he said, Whitley, there is a powerful magnetic field on your garage door switches, much more powerful than anything this equipment can generate. But it is so powerful that even the door is, though the door is wide open, they are the, the switches are not tripped. And he showed me in his magnetometer, and it just went wham. The needle shot all the way over to the to the right because it was so powerful. He said, "I can we we tried to uh, download the system information from the from the alarm system, but it did not work. That was all sc- all scrambled." So then uh, he replaced the switches, and it worked fine after that. Later that afternoon, I started to notice pain in this ear uh, 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 and, uh, and then a lump. And after a few days, the lump began to function. It would, the ear would turn bright red, and I would hear a noise, a sort of grinding noise, high-pitched, medium-pitched, rather, grinding noise. I did not know what was going on, but I did know about implants, and I was terrified that, (laughs) my God, they've put one of these damn things in me. What am I going to do about this? It's horrifying. And uh, the net result was I left Annie wanted me to leave it in. She said, let's figure out what it is and what it does. It's See if we can contact it or use it in some way. And... uh, I was very paranoid about it, as you may imagine. But but I left it in for about a year, two years maybe, and it turned on and off and on and off. We lost the cabin, ran out of money, and uh, ended up in a little condo in San Antonio, Texas, which is I, I had owned during my mother's lifetime. And fortunately, because it was there, we didn't go homeless. But in any case... We ended up there, and we met in San Antonio Dr. William Mallow, who was the head of materials science at Southwest Research. And we were over there. I was telling him about the implant, and we were actually studying implants that were being produced by Dr. Roger Lear at the time out of other witnesses. And one afternoon at at his office, my implant turned on, and when it turns on, Get, the ear gets bright red and very hot. It's obviously emitting some kind of signal. So there's a very f- sophisticated signals acquisition lab at Southwest. And uh, we rushed into that lab. They picked up a signal. And Bill told me it was the most unusual signal that they'd ever picked up. But then he wouldn't tell me anything more about it. So it uh, because the, most of the lab's equipment is classified anyway. Recently, two years ago, I was at the San Antonio Public Library Foundation as one of the guests, one of the honorees. And during my time there, some men walked up to me and said that they had been present when that signal had been acquired. And they just wanted me to know that it is still under study and it is the most unusual signal that they have ever acquired. And they walked away without another word. So... Now I use the implant every day of my life. It's turned in, into a, a tool and an appliance. I'm very familiar with it, and I just, Annie was absolutely right. It should have stayed. We did, at one point, try to get it taken out. In, in fact, as I recall, you wrote about uh, at least a piece of it did get removed. Yes, that's right. When the doctor tried to remove it, it went from, he touched it with the edge of a scalpel, and it went from here down to here, inside my ear into the earlobe and moved. And he said, well, I can't take it out without cutting off your whole ear. And uh, so he, he pulled out and closed up the little injury there. And he uh, then he, he, he had a little corner of it, and it was taken to a lab. And the lab reported that it was a, a, a sliver of metal uh, with motile cilia protonaceous cilia coming out of it. In other words, it's a biomechanical piece of technology. A couple of days after the attempted surgery, it came up from the 
earlobe back up here to the top of my ear where it stays today. So the original piece that was removed, that little corner to which you referred, uh, has that been kept? Ah, uh, by Southwest Research. Like, who knows where it is? Mm. It ended up there and disappeared. Bill said, I'll give it back to you. And I went out to get it, and he opened the drawer of his desk and said, hmm, it's, it's gone. I've lost it. Oh. Uh, it's not, I don't know who t- has it, but mm. obviously it's not, wasn't lost. And, uh, it, it disappeared into this enormous, complicated, classified system that studies this stuff, unfortunately. Well, this, at this point, the story sounds like a uh, very high tech. They got through your alarm system. They created a very mysterious magnetic field. They implanted a, uh, a metallic device in, into your earlobe that was able to move around through, by itself. Through the skin with no, mm-hmm. no opening. There was no injury. There was just red there. Yeah. It, 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 there was no, no cut. So, so, so far, it would seem as if we're dealing with some sort of high-tech visitors. But as you, as the story unfolds, it's very clear that it has to do with the afterlife. It has to do with shamanistic-like occurrences, uh, that it's much more than simply technology. Oh, God, yes. This is about, you know, Colonel Philip Corso has been much criticized. Largely, he was, he came out some years ago, right before he died, and published a book about his UFO knowledge. And he was immediately furiously debunked, primarily because he was probably telling the truth. And the reason I think that is, first, I knew him, and he was a very sincere guy. Mm -hmm. And second, um, he, he, he said something terribly important. He said that he had been in a situation in a cave, I won't go into all the details, where he'd had a brief face-to-face contact with one of these beings who wanted to leave the area but in a machine of theirs, but couldn't do so because the radar, there was too much radar turned on, and they wanted to turn the radar off for 10 minutes. And Corso's response was, you know, well, you know, in, in in my world, in the military, 10 minutes is, can be an eternity. So what's on, what's here for us? What do we get for doing that? And the answer was a new world if you can take it. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is the defining statement. However it came into Philip Corso's head doesn't even matter. That's the truth. A new world if you can take it. It will not be given to us for very good reason. But if we can take it, if we can wrest the information out of our, out of their hands, and if we can bear what we find, and what we're going to find is that the whole barrier between the living and the dead breaks down. There is, and suddenly you're living in an entirely different reality because the soul does exist. It isn't something to be sneered at and laughed at it's real and it's actually the reason we are here and the reason we are of interest isn't even because of our intelligence which is moderate on the scale of intelligence in this universe high moderate uh what is interesting to about us is our ability to move our attention and our deep physicality Because our souls are here absorbing an enormous amount of physical experience and being altered by it very dramatically. And that's unusual. Mm -hmm. So we're an interesting uh, specimen. Well, I'd like to come back to the implant, if 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 we can. You say you're using it now, uh, yes, and, and have been for some years. So how does it work? What? How do you use it? Well, it's really very interesting. Uh, first of all, it doesn't give a damn whether or not I'm going to the grocery store. It's not a tracking device. Um, it, 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 I'll give you a perfect example. This is recent. I'm always wanting to test it because is this real? Is this real? You know, I, in, in a kind of a basic way, 
Because, yes, I know the implant's there, and I know the implant's real, but am I actually using it or just deluding myself? So I said to the implant, I want to know something, you to teach me something that I know nothing whatsoever about and that is critically important to the new book I'm writing. And what happened was, now, you it doesn't talk, it's not a... It's, it, it will open a slit in, in my eye and you can see writing, uh, typed writing going racing past in the slit very quickly, but you can't read except an occasional snatch of it because it's moving too fast. Um, you can't see it easily except unless you're against a white background and then you will see it there. But that's because this is subliminal information it's not going into my intellect it's going some into my conscious intellect it's going somewhere deeper so the next day i began to cogitate something happened involving the number 137 mm. and i knew nothing about that significance of that number at the time it's a very significant number to me well to you it is yes <laughs> but it wasn't to me i didn't even know it existed mm -hmm. so finally i googled this number and of course the whole mystery of the fine structure constant exploded into my consciousness and i was led to wolfgang pauli and his relationship with carl jung and the and right to the mysterious line between the mystical and the scientific that is on which the fine structure constant lies mm -hmm. in other words probably the most crucial possible piece of information for the book i'm working on that's how the implant works that's, that isn't that cool that, <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool that's fascinating and yeah and, uh, you know exactly. i i have been fascinated by that number for decades and uh, have uh, actually i don't think i've done any interviews specifically on it but one could i mean yeah. there's just a an encyclopedia of information that comes out of that one number and folks the reason why is we don't know why that number is that number and not another mm -hmm. number, yeah. basically. And it's, it, it, it is the distance between the spectral lines of, uh, a, a, a spectrograph in a spectrograph that are emitted by, uh, uh, electrons. Is that correct? Well, I, I'm not a physicist myself. I believe it's related to the ratio of the weak force in physics to the electromagnetic force. Yeah, that's 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 a better way of putting it, uh, it because it's more direct. Uh, but in any case, we don't know why it is. Yeah. But we do know that the universe would not work the same way it does if it was any other number. That, that's right. And at, at the same time, it's kind of an arbitrary number. But without it, human life uh, or life of any kind wouldn't exist in our universe. Exactly. Exactly. And <laughs> that the arbitrariness of the number, it's its not like something like the Planck, Planck constant, which we can understand why that constant, which is the minimum possible distance between two, se two separate objects that without them linking, why that constant is like that. But the, the fine structure constant is a mystery. It's arbitrary. Yeah. My uh, friend, Saul Paul Sirag, who was a physicist and mathematician, bases a lot of his own work on, on that number. So uh, that would be a, a place I would point our viewers. I've done five interviews with him about his theoretical work. So uh, one could go into great depth. It leads one into string theory. It leads one into hyperdimensional space. It uh, has a, a great deal to do with the mathematical foundations of reality as we know it. Here's another story about the implant and its workings. Uh, back it, during the run-up to the last election, I asked my wife, who I am in occasional pretty clear contact with who would win the election in September of that before the election that was in November and she said Trump immediately hmm. and I thought oh god this is my imagination that's the <laughs> worst possible outcome yeah. it can't be true because Clinton was well ahead and 
the polls and Trump was not expecting to win and coming up from behind. And lo and behold, he did win. And at the time he won, I suddenly became aware of the fact that an enormous amount of intimate information about Adolf Hitler was coming into my mind from somewhere. And, you know, I, I was, I've read William Shirer's book and a few other books about, uh, World War II, but not specifically about Hitler, mostly in the histories of World War II and, you know, which Hitler played a, played a huge role in, but I've never read like a biography of Hitler. But I began to become aware of the fact that I was having very, uh, an intimate awareness of Hitler's inner life that was coming from somewhere. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I could make a book out of this. Mm. And I had to be a novel because I didn't have any particularly specific data. But I began to write it in the form of a memoir by a young man, a man who's now old. He's writing in the 70s. And he was a young German-American, wealthy German-American, who was kind of sucked up by Hitler in 1931 before it was clear what he actually was and was doing and became his confidant and remained so throughout the war because as the war progressed and he realized how dangerous Hitler was as the 30s progressed, he became a uh, spy for the Allies, at first just for Churchill and then for the Allied cause r right close to Hitler. And... In the writing of the book, I it has got the most intimate portrait of Adolf Hitler ever written. And I couldn't publish it. No one would buy it. Oh. Be because it's by Whitley Strieber, and that's a nasty no-no name in the publishing business now. Well, you've but, got 40 books out. I'm surprised I know, but, to hear but, that. But, uh, there has been such a hardening against this whole UFO thing lately in the past five or six years. It's unbelievable. They won't touch it, even though it's extremely popular. And my name is associated with that, not with historical novels also. And that was another problem. Hmm. So I put it out myself. And I put it out under a, an open pseudonym of Jonathan White Lane. And, and it's called In Hitler's House, The Memoir of William Weber. Hmm. And it is an extraordinary experience to have written. All I can say is I, I even found out what toothpaste Hitler used. It was extraordinary. I couldn't think of nothing that I needed didn't come to me. Hmm. And it was all through the, the use of the implant, which is very indirect. You can't, you can't expect a direct answer, but if you wait well, what you need comes to you from it. Well, were you able to actually validate any of this information? Oh, yeah. Like the Absol toothpaste? Absolutely. Uh -huh. I validated it all. Oh. <laughs> I, that's the thing. It would, I would get this information to float into my head and then I would be able to do research on it. And I even found like the way I validated that <clears throat> was from a little book that had written, been written by Hitler's personal valet in German. And I had a, got a copy of it and had a, a German speaker translated for me. And indeed, it was exactly as I had already discovered. To shift a little bit, you mentioned that you're in communication with your late wife, Anne. At uh, times, yes. Mm -hmm. Is that also in any way related to the implant? Well, I'll, I think it probably is, and I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Uh, while I was writing the Hitler book, my writing got much better. I was really gotten I had gotten I, I it made a, a take, taken a new step forward in my writing and the implant was working absolutely overtime uh it was just there were in the little slit there were words just sailing past all the time at breakneck speed and um i finally asked it who are you because it was different it was much better than it had ever been before and very slowly and clearly, they came came across in the slit, it's me, Anne. She is the one, of course, who encouraged you to keep the implant. <laughs> and she also is the, was my muse during my life. Uh, she was so incredibly important to everything. She um, is the one who named the book Communion. 
And she said, it's because is that's what it's about. And when I told Anne, I finally got up the guts to tell Anne what had I thought had happened to me. Anne didn't react the way you would think. Anne didn't say, oh, my God, Whitley, uh, you know, I'm concerned about our son because, you know, you're going, this is a deep end thing. This is very serious. I want you to see a psychiatrist and I don't want to hear anything more about this. She said, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. We can do a lot with this. Mm-hmm. And that was how communion started. And Anne's presence in the writing of that book, every word of it, every she edited it in detail. It was as if Anne was there to to do this, that she was absolutely made for it. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that you report is that after Communion came out, and it was a huge international bestseller at, at the time, you received hundreds of thousands of letters from people who had had similar experiences. That's correct. And Anne took that in hand. Anne could read very quickly. Anne was a person who would, she would read a novel, a, a complex novel in an afternoon quite easily. And um, she took those letters in hand and began reading them and cataloging them and keeping the ones that had more complex stories and let, letting the others that just said, well, thank you for the book, etc., go out, out, out. And she ended up with about nine or ten boxes of letters which are now at Rice University in the collection that Jeff Kripal is supervising. So it, even if the visitors don't exist, they represent one of the best collections of folkloric narrative in the world. And it was all Anne that did that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I always like to speak of her contribution because it's a very important one. But maybe the most important part of it happened one day when she walked out of her office with a sort of bemused look on her face and said, Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death. And it changed everything, Mm -hmm. everything at that moment, because I realized that contact with the visitors and contact with the dead is the same thing, essentially. Well, at least it would seem as if they're related. I mean, there could be different phenomena that have some sort of connection with each other. Well, that's what I mean, actually, yeah. uh, that that you, the visitors don't have a barrier between the living and the dead I- unless they are us in another form, which is also, I think, a real possibility because mm-hmm. nature is prolific in creating multiformed species. And maybe we are one. Mm-hmm. How could the caterpillar ever imagine the butterfly? Ever. And yet there it is. Or the tadpole, the frog. Mm -hmm. And yet there it is. It's certainly easy to imagine. I know uh, Olaf Stapledon, uh, the great science fiction writer, and uh, I believe uh, a couple of his novels talks about many different transmutations that the human species might go through. Yeah, that's right. I believe he does. I haven't read Stapleton in too long, but uh, uh, in any case, all this gets back to the actual fact that this is not a decided thing. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful, fabulous question, because on the one hand, we're talking about this side of it. On the other hand, uh, I'm close to people who study some extremely strange materials like Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. And uh, these materials can't exist Mm -hmm. in this universe, and yet here they are. And they supposedly came from a UFO crash site. Now, you're talking about physical materials. Physical materials, exactly. And here I am talking about the possibility that that, that this may be about communication with the dead, and then the implant, in fact, is to a degree that. But it's a physical thing. Yeah. That's the wonder, delight of this question. That's why it makes it so much fun to be in the place I'm in, Mm -hmm. in the world. Because I like questions. And my wife said after she died, she said, uh, the human species is too young to have beliefs. We need to stick with the questions. And I love that (laughs) statement because we are, if you look at our, our history, 
It is a history of battling and fighting and killing each other over beliefs. Whose belief is right? My belief is right, and I believe that, and I'm going to kill you because you don't believe it. That's happening right now in Syria. It's what ISIS is all about. It's what Wahhabism is all about. It's what the church was all about throughout the whole Middle Ages. People also commit suicide because of their beliefs. So and, yeah. beliefs are very powerful. There, there's no question about it. And so what you're suggesting is that if we're going to understand this phenomenon, we would do well to let go of all of our preconceptions. Letting go of belief is the most freeing thing in the world. And it is, it becomes, you, you realize, you come to this place where you say, I know, I don't know. And the mind wants to fill that gap. It wants to say, no, no, no. It, it, you can't look at this and say you don't know what it is. That looks like a flying saucer. That must be from another planet. That's from uh, Zeta Reticuli. And, it's the greys and it's the reptilians better watch out for them and and soon you have this whole cosmology and folklore all mixed up in your head and you you begin to live it as if it was real but we don't know you're known as a, as a writer of uh, horror novels and some of the experiences that you've had also are, are reminiscent of horror novels. I'm thinking of the experience of the giant spiders uh, in in the bedroom above your wife. Uh, and I, I couldn't put that in a horror novel. It was too scary. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny to me because you, you seem to love your life. You enjoy these experiences, but honestly, some of them are horrific. to the visitors have become so connected with me is that I am amused and entertained by by horror. Fear is fascinating to me, and I, I, I am perfectly capable of experiencing fear without rejecting it, and uh, which I do all the time. In fact, recently I did it a couple of times in pretty intense situations. Um, but with regard to the spiders, that was a very, very interesting experience. Mm -hmm. um, at the time... I had, was having intimate contact with a group of people who would come to the cabin very noisily and drop down onto the roof uh, of the of, of my meditation room that I had there, and they would uh, then come in through the roof, and you could feel their presence, but they weren't visible. And I had one of them. I couldn't meditate with them unless I had seen them, and so one of them had made himself visible briefly, and so we were working like this and uh uh i was annie once came into the room and she wanted to meditate with them too but then the crash 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 of all the thudding on the roof came and she said actually i'm not ready for this <laughs> she left yeah but in any case one night they began kind of paging through my mind and i would see images of my life one after another it was like I guess it was sort of like one of those life reviews they talk about when you're when you're dying, and um, I uh, they stopped at a moment in which I had been attracted to a woman other than Anne. And being a man, and you know, I'm I, if a beautiful woman comes up to me and flirts with me, I'm going to react like all men do. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to abandon my wife or cheat on her or anything, which I never in my mind. That wasn't good enough for them. They saw this and didn't like it. So then, um, later that night, I woke up, and the ceiling, entire roof of the cabin was gone. And there, there was un, something behind it, a blackness, which is not the, the universe of stars as we know it. It's another blackness. And you don't want to look at that long. That's that's very hard. And there, you, I could see these people peering at me from kind of around the edges. And I thought, this can't be good. But then I fell asleep again immediately because they made me do that. I woke up sometime later, and to my absolute horror, there were these gigantic spiders 
clinging to the now reappeared cathedral ceiling. They were about, oh, a good foot, foot and a half long with huge abdomens that were black, shiny abdomens with yellow tiger stripes on them. They were very, very disappointing things to find hanging above your bed in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God, this must be some sort of a nightmare. But I could hear them, and I could also see, I mean, they, they were scratch. one of them especially was scratching against the wood as if it was going to fall off on Anne, who was sleeping beside me peacefully. And I, th- I, I, got, I, I thought, I got, God, what am I going to do? And I thought I, I wanted to get out of the bed and run out of there desperately. And I got up and I looked, I turned around. I'm now standing up wide awake and they're still there. And the one hanging over Anne is in more trouble than it was before. So I forced myself to go around that bed and to lie on top of her so that would not fall on my girl. And they disappeared. Mm-hmm. It was a test. Are you really in love? How much you find out? You discover right now tonight how you feel here. What is your real link to this woman? And now they knew my real link to this woman was I would give my life for her. I really would. That's a very powerful experience. Obviously, even remembering it now, you're you're still a bit shaken by it. I can see that. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, any psychologist would say that what seems to have occurred here is an externalization of your own inner emotions around uh, the memory of uh, a woman who had once tempted you and some guilt, some lingering yeah, guilt so, around that. that right. so it, it, your own inner psyche managed to externalize itself in, into the room where you were in the form of those spiders. Yes, unless it was drawn out of me or given to me from someone else, I don't know. But that's certainly a very valid possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are lots of possibilities, though. I I perceive it as something that was done to me to to enable me to discover my real bond to my wife, which is still to this day extremely strong. I'm still married. I wear both rings because in my estimation, we're still together, but we just have one body left. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I happen to be the one running it. <laughs> well, that's a, a beautiful way of putting it. And uh, it also brings to light the emotional component ar- around these experiences. You, you know, so many parapsychologists like myself like to think in terms of experimental design and proofs. Uh, and we neglect the emotions. But because of your background in literature, uh, you have a, a deep appreciation for that. And I think uh, the scientific community would do very well to pay attention to these things. Well, it, it's an interesting question about the scientific community. And the reason is this. Um, science proceeds on the study of what it can detect. And in the, the present situation... There's something here that's very big. I think it's probably much bigger than us. I think that we are part of it. It is not part of us. But we can't detect it. And maybe that's because it does not wish to be detected. Maybe because it is extremely, it is highly conscious, highly intelligent, and does not want us to gain a foothold, as it were, in our relationship with it. It wants us to remain as we are, more or less supplicants, uh, and unable to really dimensionalize it in our own minds, because the, uh, in terms of science, I mean, because mm-hmm. science can't detect it. But in terms of the individual experience, the emotional experience, and the academic exploration of the culture that has grown up around it, that we can work with, that we have. 
Mm -hmm. it, it's a very elusive phenomenon, but I was also fascinated by several of the reports uh, that you wrote about where after the publication of communion, different groups of people would come to visit you and stay overnight in your cabin or, or in the hope of actually having some experience themselves. And often they did. Oh, they did. Annie, Annie was the one who selected the people. She knew who would have experiences and who wasn't, wouldn't from reading the letters. And um, she, I don't know how she knew, but she would, every once in a while as she was working with that, she would put a letter aside. And uh, I would, I said once, I said, what are these letters you put aside? She said, those are people who are coming to the cabin. Mm. And, and she <laughs> built that. And they came. In fact, the first group, was a group of, I believe, about six or seven people. And among them was a the editor of a big magazine then called New Age Magazine. Mm -hmm. And he had promised that if they showed up, he would make it, he would write about it and make it a cover story on the magazine. And so they showed up. The little dark blue figures at times seem rather comical, but are actually not all that funny uh, when you get to know them. You call uh, them the kobolds. The kobolds, yeah. That's because they that's what they were called in Bavaria, uh, where under large parts of Bavaria, you will find many tunnels sm too small for a human being to have carved that are under there very mysteriously. And people used to see these dark blue figures in mines in that part of the world. So I call, that's why I call them kobolds, because they are dark blue. Mm -hmm. And um, they wear what look like work suits that are dark blue. And any cobalt blue. And in any case, the, there were people, four people sleeping in the living room on cots and on a convertible couch. They were all immobilized, but could still talk to each other. And these figures jumped around in the room. So they could see them and they were talking to each other, including this editor. And meanwhile, downstairs, the couple awoke and found standing at the foot of the bed, a woman that they knew who had died in 1983 in the Mexico City earthquake. So you had the supposed aliens in the living room and a dead person downstairs saying basically that she was all right so what did it mean that was the first experience at the cabin um the editor then reneged and wouldn't write about it because he was afraid it would ruin his career and uh that ha he had he, and it was unfortunate he didn't do that it was a basic mistake because you know they had he had guaranteed to them he would do it and they came and he didn't do it mm -hmm. and so he's got that still in his life yeah um the second time that we had people there with when the visitors showed up was um um we had uh, raven dana a lady called raven dana and a lady called laurie barnes and another lady who were there and the visit, one of the visitors showed up in, we also had a, a, a camera set up, a low light camera. And we had, um, um, uh, Drew Cummings was there with his wife. He was a documentary filmmaker from LA. He was in the living room. They were in the convertible couch. Raven was in one bedroom and Laurie and the other lady were in another bedroom and Dora Ruffner and Ed Conroy and our son Andrew and me were all down in the woods sleeping because I, I stayed with my son because uh, uh, there was no other bed in the house. It was too full. So what happened that night was totally remarkable. Um, the first thing that happened was Raven Dana woke up to find this being coming in right through the through the screen window, which was screwed closed and it, with the great big black eyes. And it touched her on the arm. And then it asked her, what can I do?
do for you? And she said, you could go down that hall, which was where the camera was trained. The next thing we knew, the lady in the other bedroom and Laurie Barnes were both waked up by this being in the same way. And it remained in that room briefly and then disappeared. Then Drew Cummings woke up and seeing, looked and saw a little man with a great big head leaning over the convertible couch. When, of course, he assumed that this was all nonsense, that this was n not real. And suddenly here it was quite real. And he was horrified, whereupon it changed into the face of a hawk and dis disappeared. About an hour later, dawn came and Andrew and I decided to come back to the house. As we were walking up to the house, we had a view of the house the, before us, the swimming pool and a deck, and then a view across an, a yard that led into the woods. And out of the front door of the house, there came a hooded figure about three feet tall, which walked down the deck, sort of translucent across the yard and then shot off into the woods, dodging the trees at breakneck speed. We both stood there seeing this. We rushed into the house and Drew Cummings and his wife were on their feet because they had experienced just moments before a tremendous burst of heat. And that was left behind when this being was leaving. Uh, and I talked about this to a, a couple of scientists and the interesting conclusion was the reason it had become invisible must have been that it was actually using gravity to controlled gravity to bend light around it so that it couldn't be seen, but that doing this was creating heat. And when it left, it released a lot of the heat. And that's why we could sort of see it. It was sort of translucent. So there was technology as well as mystery there that night. Uh, and that's, so those are the two, two cabin stories. There were a couple of others. Um, yeah, but those are two, the two biggest ones with multiple witnesses. What, whatever became of the uh, potential documentary film? We looked and looked and looked on that tape. There wasn't a sign of anything. Mm. So frustrating. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, I meditate. I have a surveillance camera in this house, but I can always tell when something is going to happen during my meditations, even if I'm not going to perceive it because the camera turns itself off. Mm -hmm. If I met it, if I don't, if it doesn't turn itself off, then it's just me. If it does, I presume I'm not alone when I meditate. How interesting. So the, cam yes. the camera is configured to do that. Well, it's no, I mean, it's not configured to turn itself off. It just does it. Oh, and, and you get in the morning when you look for the footage, you, it said that your camera was not turned on <laughs> and it's turned off. I, it can be turned off in the software. I, I see. Well, now speaking of your meditation practice, uh, I learned uh, in reading the book that even prior to the experience you wrote about in communion, you were involved for, I believe, 15 years with a Gurdjieff group. I was in the Gurdjieff Foundation for 15 years then, yes. I still do the Gurdjieff work, and some members of the foundation consider me still to be in, in it. But I started in 1970, and I was taught something called the sensing exercise by Joseph Stein and William Siegel, who were teachers in the foundation. And uh, this exercise is a matter of moving your attention into your physical sensation, into your body in a methodical way. And um, I've been doing it since then, since 1970. In fact, I don't think the visitors would have showed up in my life if I hadn't done it. I, a, the, I don't think they would have seen me. And B, uh, there would have been no basis for communication. Uh, when I say seen me, what I mean is this. Uh, back in... September of 2015, just after Annie passed away, I was at a conference in Nashville with William Henry, uh, who does 
conferences on spiritual matters from time to time there, and his wife Claire, who were great friends of ours. And I, we, at a break in the conference, a woman came up to me and said, Mr. Strieber, the strangest thing just happened to me. I just want to tell you something, and I, I don't, I don't know quite how to uh, uh, say this. And I said, but go ahead and say it. Because you're not going to, I'm not going to be surprised by the strangeness of it, obviously, <laughs> whatever it is. And so she said, well, your wife Anne just talked to me. I heard her very clearly in my ear say, tell Whitley I can see him when he's in the chair. And that meant a lot because that meant the time I would be sitting in the evenings doing the sensing exercise. And I realized why then, years before, the, one of the visitors had said to me that they came because they saw a glow. I thought that the time they met the glow of cities and so forth, but they didn't. They met the glow of me. When you place your attention on your nervous system, it increases the energy output, and they can see that. And when they see that, they know that this is a person who possesses a certain tool that they can use to communicate and they will sometimes come and they became involved with me then and when i realized that with annie i started redoubling my efforts at my meditations because i knew she was there she would do it no sooner had i done that than one night at 3 a.m i was waked up by the dickens being shocked out of one of my toes. And I leaped up but couldn't explain it. And I went back to bed. But then the next night, somebody invisible grabbed my this nipple, and my, le my right nipple, and shook it like the dickens. And uh, you, you notice this. I barreled out of the bed that time because it was like someone was in the house. And there was nobody in the house, in the apartment. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute. They've tried before to get me to meditate at 3 a.m. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did the sensing exercise. And since then, it has become a ritual. Uh, the last time they woke me up to do it was night before last. And they wake me up now by blowing in my face. Uh, normally, I will wake up myself. I purposely don't use an alarm or anything like that. I want this to be more organic because that's how it feels it should be. Uh, last night I woke up myself at 3 a.m. and uh, and meditated for about half an hour. Uh, as I say, the night before was uh, they they woke me up and it goes like that now and it's very comfortable and I'm I've been doing it since 2015 September of 2015 and I feel great. Well, I think it's a wonderful practice meditating at, at 3 a.m., but I'm under the impression that uh, it's not just meditation that's happening for you. Some I, Are you experiencing contacts during those meditations? Quite often, yes. Um, I in, am quite often experiencing them, and um, uh, it is a, 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 an intimate friendship now and um not to say that uh, there was this there have been some contretemps uh i was back in february of 2018 i was begging and pleading with them to come out because i see our planet is dying and we don't know it and they've already said to me about the a climax of of climate change it will come upon them unaware. And it's made me crazy because I've got three beautiful grandkids. I want this place to last. And so I'm begging them and begging them to, to just come out publicly with me for 15 minutes and I could then change the world because they've also given me all kinds of information about how to fix the climate, that it takes a lot of work, but we can do it if we had the motive and they, their presence in this would give us the motive. So what happens? They are very aware of the fact that we have a lot of trouble handling them when we are face-to-face -face with them. And I admit that it's hard, even for me after 30 years of, of, of interaction. So here's what happens. 
I wake up one night at three, and I'm aware of the fact that there's something in the bed between my legs. Now, I don't have cats or dogs. It's not going to be an animal from the outside. The ones that have been with me for the past few years are very small. They're only about a couple feet long. So I thought, oh, my God, there it's one of them. And it's within inches of my gonads. It is in the most intimate spot in this bed that it could be in. Now, what am I going to do? And instinct took over. I leapt out of the bed. It leapt out with me, left a big gash on my one of my calves, calves, which Jeff has a picture of. I took pictures of it. Mm. And it shot out, off out of the house. And there I was with my answer. You're not, if, you're, if you can't take us, how can the others? And it was agonizing. Later, recently, there's been something else that's much more hopeful. That was this. I had a. I had been really thinking about Annie, and I had been meditating very deeply, and it felt as if she was with me. It was very powerful stuff for a few nights, and then one night last week, uh, I was just lying in bed after the eleven o'clock meditation, just about to go to sleep, when I felt a very gentle presence sit down on me right right over my genitals. And this is all very, this isn't, they, 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 whatever's going on here does not, is not modest. So you'll just have to accept that. And then I, I thought to myself, my God, it's one of them is sitting on me. And I started to open my eyes and then I thought, no, you don't do that yet. Because every time I tried to look at them, something goes wrong, like what had just happened last February. And um, so I lay there and just let it happen. And this, oh, incredible, sweet, beautiful energy filled my body. It, it was lovely, lovely experience, so poignant and rich. Uh, and, and, and delicious in a physical sense. It felt wonderful. And then gradually it faded and I did open my eyes and I saw a little dark figure dart off into the, into, the, in, toward the ceiling. And that was it. After a while, I went to sleep. I did the, um, 3 a.m. meditation, which was very deep and powerful. And then after that, I proceeded to have what were not dreams. They were like I was in these other places. And of course, they weren't temples or heaven or anything. One of them appeared to be a kitchen. And I always end up like that. I'm the guy, you know, when I have a an out-of-body experience, I go, it's all, I, I'm living on the ordinary level of life. And uh, so, but this was not an out-of-body experience. It was not a lucid dream. It was like I was actually there for a couple of minutes. Then I asked the implant what went on the morning that night. And after a while, I had the impression that I should telephone a certain woman that I know who's been to India. And I called her and I described the experience. And she said, oh, Whitley, I can explain that completely. That was a Kundalini experience. I've had the same experience, but it was induced in me in India by a certain guru. And, um, uh, he accidentally healed one of my pierced ears during the experience because it's very healing what was done. And, uh, I, I ended up with my, the pierced ear gone, the piercing gone out of one of my ears, uh, during the experience. But she said, Whitley, one of the things that happens after that is, uh, bilocation. It's a, it's something that is often followed by bilocation experiences. Did you have one? And I realized that I did. Hmm. I bilocated. That was what that strange experience was. It was bilocation. 
I bilocated into somebody's kitchen. This is such a rich story. We could pursue it in, in many different d dimensions. But uh, one I would like to take is to come back to the uh, female figure that you reported on in, in communion. And uh, you reported that you actually did have one or two sexual experiences. Uh, uh, I sure did. Yeah. And and it, it's as if your wife and it what didn't show any jealousy about this. No, not at all. Yeah. No, Anne just rolled with it. Uh, she was perfectly happy uh, to, for, for me to have these experiences, and they were incredible. One of them took place in the, in the guest room in our house in upstate New York. I woke up, and I was lying on my back <clears throat> with the most fantastic erection you could imagine. And I was already inside the body of this being, this woman, who was sitting on me and proceeded to have a fiery, unbelievably intense sexual experience. The room was full of people, one of whom I recognized. Uh, and they seemed very, uh, they didn't seem, they seemed very embarrassed and to be there and, uh, and, I couldn't see her face. Her face was blacked out, but I could see the rest of her body. And it, it was just a very, very, very powerful experience. The most, it was so delightful that it almost would, I would think would have burned me out if I had, if it kept on for very long. But here's a fascinating story about the man I saw standing there whom I knew. I knew from years I've known him for years. Uh, just about four years ago, I met a gentleman from Romania who said that he had had only one experience in his life of this. And during the experience, he had had a mystery book with him, a, a mystery story. And he was asked during the experience, which he didn't remember at all, to underline a certain name in the book. And he did that, but then didn't know why. And it, the book was in Romanian, and, and um, he couldn't remember anything about what had happened uh, to him. Only that. And I said, well, what was the name? The name is the name of the man who was in the room that night. And he said to me that this man had seen something and had been told that he must never tell anyone what he saw. So I've talked to the man since then, and I've said, you know, I seem to remember you up at my cabin. And he says, um, no, I don't think I was ever there. I said, yeah, I believe you were. Don't you remember coming up there? No, he says, I don't. <laughs> you know, you, you get a chance to live like this, and you can either take it one or two ways. You can fall in love with it, or you can curl up and go into a fetal position and just pray to God it goes away. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with her. And um, I've got her picture right here. I, if you let me, I can pick it up and bring it down. There are two pictures on this wall, my wife and her, and they are my constant companions when I'm working, the two of them. That is the picture uh, that you you had painted for the cover of Communion. That is the original <clears throat> picture. And, and, and you know, when I read through uh, the supernormal, I noticed that you referred to that picture twice. And, and once you wrote that you had painted it, and another time you wrote that you had had it painted. Oh, no, I didn't paint it. Uh, yeah. I had it painted. I, I sat beside the artist while he painted it, and I had it painted. I'd, I must have been a slip. Is it? Is it written in supernatural it says yeah, I yeah I think maybe it's a typo but it also sort of implied that you were really involved I mean it wasn't heavily involved I was yeah. every single brush stroke came from me that is a portrait from from my memory 
Mm-hmm. And, and Jeff Kripal, when I um, interviewed him about uh, uh, another book he wrote, The Secret Body. In which, which is an incredible book. Yes, and he refers, of course, to the supernormal in that book, and uh, or supernatural. And, supernatural. Yeah, he... Uh, he says that to him, as a scholar of religion, that is an image of a Hindu goddess. Of, I think he was referring to Kali. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Kali, because she does a lot of very Kali-like things. Mm-hmm. And uh, she had a relationship with my wife, a very friendly and comfortable relationship. And I had this sense, sense that they might be both the same being, that Anne and this being might be kind of the same. Uh-huh. It would make sense. Yeah, that Anne was very connected to her. Mm-hmm. And because some of the some of the sexual experiences were really intimate and um and lovely. I mean, they were wonderful if you don't mind a rather dominating female presence, which I got used to quite quickly. I mean, she called all the shots. I was just there. Like a, the opposite of what usually happens in sex, I guess. Well, I think it's unusual that uh, for some reason it would seem as if she didn't want you to see her face at those moments. Uh, I think that probably might have turned me off. Mm. Because it, she's a lot prettier in the portrait than she is in real life. Uh, I... and, you know, um, uh, Bruce Lee, who was an uh, editor at William Morrow, saw her face to face in a bookstore in Manhattan. And he never stopped talking about her eyes. That the black eyes that are on the on the painting, you can take those covers off, and there's someone else under there. Her those are like dark glasses or something. I think I don't know what they are, but she has blue eyes, and this blue in these eyes, I mean, it takes you into another world. It, and he said, Bruce Lee said that he had never experienced anything as powerful as the loathing in her eyes. And I don't experience that. When I've seen her naked, I have seen something so desirable that it's agonizing, agonizing. It's, I can't take it for long. Because I just, I want to merge with, with it. It's overwhelming. And that, that's, you get eyes, you know, when your face, when your her eyes are like that, I couldn't have made love with her for two more minutes if, mm-hmm. if I had been engaged with those eyes. That's why the blackness was there. You also mentioned that it was Anne who came up with the title for that book, Communion, and really implying that this is a very spiritual relationship. This is because she said it, that we should call, I was going to call it body terror because it was the most terrifying thing that had ever happened to me. And suddenly in the middle of the night, one night, she was sort of three quarters asleep. She says, Communion. You should call it Communion because that's what it's about. And, and I wasn't absolutely sure who was talking, but I said to myself, yeah, I will call it communion then. Because, because for you, the initial experience was uh, practically like, and you use that word, being raped. Well, I was raped. I, was, I had an object in, inserted into my rectum, and I jerked around so much and struggled that I tore my rectum. Ooh. And uh, the scar is still there. I still feel it. The pain isn't too bad right now, but it can, it can vary. It can get very bad. I've got medicine for it to reduce the pain that I use frequently. So you're suffering from that injury after 30 years. Yeah, it's a big scar. It's significant. And, um, you know, I was, my rectum was torn. Mm-hmm. Well, you have an amazing ability to take a frightening, painful, horrific experience and to see it in the most positive light. Well, I'm, you know, Annie said, used to say, I signed on for an interesting life and I've got my wish. Okay. I feel exactly the same way. I'm, I, you know, I'm fascinated with them. I think they might be quite dangerous, but I'm also crazy about them. And I, you know, I, I meditate with them all the time now and I'm, I'm very happy with, with this. Mm-hmm. And it, it, recently they, 
they wanted me to write one a certain book and i had a script i wanted to write in another book and when i started to write the other book there was a type of communication that was complex that i'm not going to get into that made it very clear that that other book was a mistake for me to write and then i th- thought about just thought about working on the script and the same type of communication came again and i thought well maybe i better work on the book because and now once i started working on the book the beautiful experience that i described earlier of being of having the kundalini energy come through me occurred so it's a it's very much of a of a of a reward based and threat based kind of scenario uh, they're very overstated i think hmm. but that's fine by me that hmm. that's the way they are that's the way they are maybe that's the way i am maybe that's why they are that way because ultimately the the the, the barriers that we imagine between ourselves and them are more or less illusory in fact, you've suggested many times that they are us, perhaps from the future. Yeah. Well, I have my doubts about that because I don't see how time, I, I don't see, you know, my problem with that is that time is not an, uh, a force. We have four forces in this universe that we know of, and entropy is what gives us the illusion of duration. But there's no time like gravity. That we have, we know gravity is a force, but time isn't a force. But there is something there that we don't understand. Or Einstein's observations when he was a young man uh, trying to get the clocks synchronized on the Swiss railway system would not be true, because in fact they do run at different speeds in different places. Time isn't isn't a fixed. It's not fixed like the speed of light. The speed of time is malleable so but i still wonder if it's from the it's easy to say from the future Mm. i think that it may be that the truth is that we are much larger than we think and that these bodies are kind of projections and this is why the first thing that annie said when we recontacted each other was it's a game whitley well, speaking of the game, earlier you spoke with great passion about uh, wanting to personally be instrumental in helping to address the problem of uh, global warming and climate change and uh, many other disasters that are uh, f- being built up on this planet right now because of human activity. Uh, do, do you still intend to do that? I can't. I want to. I've wanted to for years. They started to come into my life in the early 80s, I think, resulting in the writing of War Day and Nature's End. Uh, Nature's End was scoffed at by the environmental community at the time. But if you read it now, it reads like something that's actually happening. In fact, it is happening. And then there came the key, which laid out the whole mechanism of sudden climate change that led to the writing of Superstorm, but Superstorm was denigrated again by the environmental community because they wanted to see it as something more gradual. The suddenness is too disturbing, I guess. But if you look at the historical record, I mean, the geo, geo, the ge- geologic record, you find that there are instances which are when, when these changes occur very suddenly. The, the, uh, it's like a rubber band that stretches and stretches and stretches and suddenly snaps. The problem with that is it suddenly snaps and then it's a new climate regime that lasts for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And when that happens this time, I don't think that the planet in the next ideation is going to have a climatary system capable of supporting this huge human population. We are at the top of a bell curve, and we're going to go down the other side very rapidly. And I, I know it's ridiculous, but I think 
I learned from the visitors that you don't think of people. You think of individuals. And you have to keep in your mind at all times that everybody feels of themselves the same way you do of yourself. And that each of us is all we have. And that makes me desperate to make some kind of a dent in this madness. I mean, we have a a president I regard as insane, uh, saying he doesn't believe the science of climate change, and a large population who, out of their inner terror, follow him. Uh, you know, he's he's got a soul that's in deep jeopardy, and that, that always troubles me, because I have seen what happens. This is about the soul, this journey, and it's a test. And you can fail it. And I don't want anyone to fail it. I don't want Donald Trump to fail this test. I don't want any human being to fail this test. I want us to have joy, all of us. I don't think of it in terms of, well, that person's evil and I hate him. I think of it in terms of that person's making a mistake and i got to help him somehow. So, there you have it. Well, Whitley Strieber, I... um Really appreciate your heartfelt sentiments. I happen to share them. And uh, I have to say, I think Jeffrey Kripal uh, was wrong when he said that you're not like a biblical prophet. I think in many ways you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, here I am, you know, big bib- biblical prophet. You know, I, I can cook a pretty good bouillabaisse, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Whitley, this has truly been a, a joy and an eye-opener for me. Uh, Thank I, you. I'm very grateful to have had this time with you, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue the conversation because I suspect we've just scratched the surface, and I think the more that we can uh, contribute to the global conversation that's happening and keep these ideas on, on people's minds, uh, the, the better it will be for the planet. I'd like to be able to come to Albuquerque and do it face to face. I would love to have you here for an, a, a stay where we can really go into uh, uh, more depth. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being with me, Whitley. Mm-hmm.